We're back with the videos, and with that, the opportunity to work with EVE again, an excellent emulator just like GNS3. This particular video is about installing it on VMware. While it's true that EVE can be installed on some other platforms, you need to check the compatibility information. This document you see here, this PDF, I'll leave the link in the description so you can access it quickly. Let's get to what we're interested in, page 13, the installation. The first thing we need to do is download the ISO. We have two options for EVE, the professional version, which requires a license, and the community version, which is free and the one we're going to use. I've already downloaded the ISO, but you can do it without any problem. I'm going back to the document. Here's the VMware part. Basically, we need to start a new VM and specify that the installation will be customized, meaning advanced, not the typical recommended option, and that it should be version 17.5. Now we're going to go straight to the VMware section. Next, we need to tell it that the operating system will be installed later. So let's do it. Here I already have Eve. I just need to click on Create New Virtual Machine, Customized, 17.5, Next. Here, select to install the operating system later. On Linux, Ubuntu 64-bit. I'm going back to the document because it's important to follow the steps in detail. That's the key to success for being able to work on the installation and later on, the labs, installing images, and so on, right? So, here it says Ubuntu 64, and I have to give it a name and choose a location where EVE will be stored on my machine. So, I'm going to name it Ubuntu 64, then I click Next. As you can see, I haven't made any changes, it's actually very simple. Here we're going to name it EVE NG. I don't have any issues with the location, you can choose a different folder if you want, but for me, this is fine. I'll click Next. Now, this is important. Here comes the interesting part about the performance of this VM. So let's go back to the PDF and look at the different steps. Here it says it needs to be 8 cores. Uh, okay, perfect. And one processor per, uh, and one core per processor. Perfect, so I'm going to go over here, set this to 8, and leave this one as 1. As you can see, I'm basically following the information in the guide, but you can customize it even more depending on your machine's performance or capabilities. I'm going to leave it as is. I'm really going to follow the guide step by step. Next, the memory. I'm going back. Here we're going to assign 16 gigabytes. You can assign anything from 4 to even more memory. There's no problem with that. In this case, I'm just going to set it to 16. It's just for demonstration. There it is. Now I'll click next. This one is important, which is network access. I always recommend using NAT so that we can have access to the internet as well as the local network and be able to access the graphical user interface. Here in the document, there are different options. For example, in the case of a laptop, they recommend that you use the NAT option and for a desktop computer, well, that you use the bridge option. For me, based on my experience over the years and even today, I prefer NAT for either option, okay? So we're going to leave it like that and click next. Everything else related to the logical controller, we're going to leave it as recommended. That's the recommended setting, and also for the type of virtual disk, recommended as well. And here, of course, it says to create a new disk in this section. In fact, I go back to the document and it tells me to create a new disk. Now comes the capacity. Here, I go back to the document again, and it says 200 gigabytes. So, that means that Eve, the recommendation, almost like it's a requirement, no is not to assign less than 200 gigabytes. So here, you can see that by default it's assigning 20, so I'm going to add another zero and make it a single file. Then I'm going to click Next, and here basically I'm not going to change the location either, so I'll just click Next. And here what we need to do is start reviewing how we can customize the values that we're missing. Let's check the memory. It's already set to 16 gigabytes, 8 processors. Here it's important to set the ISO, okay? The location of the ISO, we said it was the community version, and I already have it there. We're going to leave the network adapter as NAT. And something important here in the processor options is that I need to enable virtualization. In fact, if I go back to the PDF, right here it tells me that in the processor options I have to enable it. If you notice, it's not letting me do it. That's not a problem. Once we finish the installation, we can go back to the features, to the settings, and then it should let us enable this checkbox. So for now, we can leave it like this, it's not an issue. We click close and then finish. Let's wait. Well, actually, I think we haven't started yet. Let me see if it lets me. 
Okay, now let me check here. Description, edit. I go back to processors and now it lets me enable virtualization, okay? No problem. So we click save and now what we're going to do is start up the VM to continue with the installation guide. Here it's important to choose community. Bare metal is not an option, not in this case. So we select the community option, which is the only one available besides bare metal. Let's wait for it to start. Here we move on to the three installation phases. It asks me for the language, so we're going to select English. Here it asks me for the layout and the variant, which have to do with the keyboard. We're going to leave it as is, click done, and then click continue so the installation can proceed. I'll quickly go back to the PDF. Basically, what we just did is also documented, the language, the keyboard. Continue with the installation. We'll move on to the next phase once this is finished. It's important to note here that in phase two, it's going to ask us for credentials. A prompt will appear, but this is something important to pay attention to because in this phase two, we do not need to log in. In fact, it says here, do not log in at this stage. So in this phase two, we're just going to let the installation continue on its own. It will restart. And then in phase three, it will ask us to log in. But at that point, we'll be able to do so. That's why it's very important to read the details. Let's continue with the installation. Here it's starting up the services, so let's wait. It still says here, second stage install in progress. We're not going to log in. We're going to wait and see what the IF logo shows us, for example, and wait until we move on to phase three. All right, it took us a couple of minutes to finish phase two. Here you can see that it no longer says in progress. So basically now we can log in with the default credentials. Let's do it, root if. And now it brings up the blue screen not the classic Windows blue screen, where I'm going to start configuring different options. The most important thing, well, I think everything is important, but as you can see, you have to set a custom root password again. We also have to configure the network settings, which is very important too. So, let's go ahead and do it now. Let's repeat. We're going to leave EVNG. We're going to leave the domain. You can change it. Here's an important clarification. We need to decide whether our setup will use static or dynamic addressing. In my case, since I have something providing DHCP, I'm going to leave it like that, okay? If you want to set a static IP, go ahead, there's no problem, you can just follow the guide. I'm going to leave it on DHCP, so I'll leave this field blank. Basically, DHCP will handle giving me all the information, and as for NTP, well, honestly, I don't have that protocol set up either. It should be a direct connection, but you can use a proxy, or even an authenticated proxy if you want. Honestly, from what I've seen in my experience, I haven't seen anyone actually use a proxy, but the option is there. In my case, it is a direct connection to the internet. Let's click OK. Perfect. And now we'll wait for phase three to finish. Done. It took us less than a minute. Phase three is now complete. As you can see, it already assigned me an IP address that I received via DHCP. Let's use the new credentials we set up in stage three. Let's check the addresses we have. In this case, it's the same one I'm going to use, 192.168.31.128. Here, I want to check internet access. I think the 8 does respond to me. Let's see if we're able to get a response from Google's domain name. I think it does as well, but now comes the real test, which is being able to access the graphical user interface. I don't see any problem with it. We'll check it right now. So I check the IP again, which is 192.168.31.128. So I'm going to go here to the browser, 192.168.31.128, and voila, we've got it, the community version. Here we use the credentials that are also documented, admin if. It's taking too long, let me see if it has something to do with the browser. I'm going to open Chrome and check the same IP, 192.168.31.128. There, it gives me access. I'm going to log out and then log back in. There it is. It looks like it was the browser. Now we're ready. We can start creating labs. We can start uploading images. I think in a future video we can start to look at or share information on how to begin installing different versions, which is what we're interested in. For example, what we've already seen over the past few years is E1, for instance, right? The one we've worked with in GNS3. Right now, what we can do, I mean, not build large topologies, but maybe install the vBond, vManage, vSmart, how to install AG, a Virtual Catalyst 8000, a CSR, a 1K, and so on. And then comes the interesting part, which has to do with another software-based technology. But I think with this we can wrap up this video, and, well, stay tuned for what's coming next.